You can kind of see a graph getting constructed here. At the end of constructing the graph, it simply calls verify graph once just to see there are no errors in there. And once the graph is verified, then you can issue the process graph call. And you can actually call it multiple times to be able to run it several times for each image that it comes through. Here is another example. Um, this, this corresponds to the diagram that I've shown before the, the first page where you have the RGB camera connected in which is trying to detect the uh, key points inside that RGB image. And, and the point that to note here is this is very similar to the previous example except that, that let's look at the for loop, the while loop in the execute graph. You see, before it, process, it, it calls the process graph, it is trying to copy the image, uh, the RGB image, into the uh, image object. And it uses the function call, calls called VX access patch and commit patch. When you do an access patch, you get a pointer in the host. Uh, in, in the host, uh, host address space, and it can be now the, the image can be copied from the RGB image into the host, and then you say commit patch. Now you're giving the control back to the host. Now underneath it might result in thank you. underneath it'll take the framework will take care of copying the buffers to wherever the underlying hardware can access the, the data to. And after the process graph, you use similar. Um, um, functions to access an array. And one more thing to notice here is uh, the the frame by UV and frame gray are not uh, virtual data. That means underlying um, graph optimizer cannot optimize much because since you said it is a you know, a data object that can be that a user can access, since the framework cannot make any assumptions, it won't try to optimize. So in this particular case, the color conversion will unnecessarily create U and V frames, which are generally not needed. Right. So as discussed earlier, graphs are very key for the efficiency, and uh, each node can be implemented in software or on the hardware, and it can be coded in any language depending on uh, the underlying platform. The nodes may be fused depending on how it is constructed. If you say that some buffers are temporary intermediate, the underlying framework may be able to fuse these uh, nodes together. And the processing can also be tiled to keep data entirely in the local memory, some of the examples that Neil was mentioning in his, uh, in his presentation. Um, OpenVX also contains a, uh, a uh, problem, I'm going to skip that. Okay, so there, are some, there are some other key features in OpenVX uh, in terms of there are special image types. There is a uniform image which basically says that all the pixels in the images are constant and they are initialized at once. So what it, it does to the framework is saying the whole image is constant now that when you create an image, underlying implementation may not have to allocate a huge buffer. It can in theory just keep one mile and optimize underneath. And there are also images that can be allocated externally using a host malloc and then as the pointer. And it has other features such as callbacks, games, directives, user kernels. User kernels are pretty much like kernels that a user can develop that runs on the host uh, on the host uh, CPU. But it follows every framework in terms of verifying the graph. It follows all the guidelines that are dictated. There's a certain API. A framework function that users have to develop to create their own user kernels. And there's a VXU library, uh, which is pretty much easy way to get started. It's just a, if you want, all you want to do is call one particular kernel, instead of creating a graph, it just gives you a small wrapper underneath, which creates a graph and then runs it automatically. There are three extensions that are provisional at this moment. One is a tile extension, which is to allow the underlying framework to uh, 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 split the image into small pieces and then run the uh, uh, graphic small tiles so that when, when a user has a particular function implemented on a tile basis, it can just schedule it accordingly to take advantage of the local caches in there. And there is also a 16-bit extension that supports 16-bit uh, uh, operations such as, you know, 16-bit convolutions, 
16 bit uh, Gaussian uh, op that operate on 16 bit images. So, in, in, in summary, OpenVX features functional and performance portable through tightly defined specification and full conformance, uh, conformance that Neil was mentioning before. It also uh, defined to get a out of the box power efficient vision acceleration. And OpenVX will be performance portable across diverse hardware. And it is extensible to go beyond what is the core specifications now. That's all I have. Cool. Thank you, Ronan. So, any questions for any of the speakers? Yeah. Uh, can you pipeline certain? Uh, uh, all your exams are pretty much equation. Uh, can you pipeline uh, certain uh, processes? Like the, if the first stage finishes the strike, the image can it pass it in the next stage, so you can parallelize the steps? Yes, so the pipelining, so given when you specify a graph, you don't specify how to pipeline it. Oh, well, the question is, uh, um, it can, will you be able to pipeline uh, if you have a graph that has multiple operations that can go one after the other? Can you do a pipeline uh, while executing? Um, it's pretty much implementation dependent as far as the OpenVX specification goes. It does not constrain any of that. So an implementation can perform, look at a graph, and decide what's the best way to execute it. One of it could be pipelining, another one of could be using scheduling it on different hardware if it is available underneath. Is, is there any performance comparison of OpenVX to OpenCV? Um, I don't have any publicly available data on that. Uh, you, do you have any? No, I think the implementations will start appearing in the next few months where we can start doing that kind of analysis. I think the um, there's no guarantee that VX will be faster than CV, but if you have good implementation of this using the graph optimizations, the opportunity is there for implementers to go significantly faster by saving round trips to memory. So um, it will depend on the implementation. So let's say the next next few months you would expect that kind of data to become available. I think that's one other question over here. Uh, what platforms are supported? Desktop, mobile? Yeah. So the primary design focus for VX is definitely the low power mobile. I mean, that's where we're making decisions. So should we do, do A or B? You know, if, if we are focused on uh, the real time mobile vision applications, uh, that's where we would design towards. But in the end, there's nothing specific about VX that precludes it from running on any, any platform. In fact, it's just that that's where we expect you know, the, the first beachhead adoption will take place because that's where the most urgent need is. You, you might be wrong, but uh, no, there's no reason why you can't ship it on, on any machine, including desktop machines if you want to. And we do, the sample implementation that we have um, will run on uh, desktop so people can develop there and then deploy and move on. Yeah, thank you. Well, in better, better real time. Yes, uh, Andrew says a good, good point. It's um, automotive as well as in Embedded. I mean, can't we to each other a little bit? But yes, automotive is probably the biggest market opportunity for deployed vision processors in the quantity right now. Okay. In your slides, you mentioned the uh, Gaussian vision acceleration. Yeah. Uh, what about the kernels in the graph have been fused? So, is there any rules you suggest? Or is a uh, device independent? Yeah, that, that's very implementation dependent. For example, if I, oh, let me give you an example. Uh, 
Let me take the last example that I got here. Could we switch back to the slides, please? Yeah, if you, if you take an example here, in, in this part of the image where it computes the gradient, where it has the gradient X and Y coming up, in theory, it doesn't have to store the image right into the external memory. It could just uh, get the GX and GY, and it could do a square root to, to get the distance out of that. It can also do an arc tan kind of an operation immediately and store the results right here. So you can kind of see it's kind of, it could fuse those together and then write it out. Okay, we're at the end of our time for this laugh. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you to all the speakers. So give us uh, two minutes to swap over, and we'll get going with the open CL off. So uh, don't go away. Check two. Check. Check two. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Take one Thanks. 